Our gospel for this Sunday comes to us from the fifth chapter of the gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, in this whole section of Mark, Jesus seems to be doing this commute back and forth across the Sea of Galilee. Last week, we heard about him calming the storm, and he keeps going back and forth and back and forth. And we skipped over a big story, but we come to this where he lands again on the side that is populated by the Jews. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him. He was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that, you may be, so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many positions and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside. And took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was about 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The gospel of our Lord. Please. Please be seated. You know, uh, you know, libraries being opened up more. I was I was having some difficulty with a friend who was you know trying to fix their car. So he was having difficulty with the automatic transmission, and he thought he was going to fix it. So he went to the library to find a book on automatic transition the transmissions, and all we could find were manuals. And with my, you know, one of, one of the things we like to do is go to the zoo and then go out to the museum, you know, desert museum and stuff like that. And uh, as I was walking along one of the, you know, walking along, I saw this uh, lizard on its hind legs telling jokes. I'm like, this is something really wonderful. And so I went, wow, it's a talking lizard. And the docent's like, no, it's a stand-up chameleon. There are times I wish I could change colors and blend in before you start throwing things at me. And one more, I get three. One more. You know, everybody's videoing everything, you know, TikTok and everything else. Everyone's videoing something. There was something. I just, you know, the other day we have steps in the house and we were doing laundry and we had, you know, we just finished doing it all. And there's this big basket of laundry that we'd all taken time. It's out of the dryer. It's all folded up and everything else like that. And I tripped. And I really wish I videoed it so you saw how it all unfolded. <laughs> See, three, all right. 
But here's a question for you all. How is your life of faith unfolding? And more importantly, how does faith actually unfold your life? I mean, think about it. Why do we fold things in the first place? We fold them up because it takes less space, right? If you've ever tried to just, you know, I, you know, there were times I've been accused of packing by throwing, you know, and you just try to throw a whole bunch of things in a bag. It takes up far more space than actually if you take the time to fold things properly, right? It keeps everything neat. It's easier to find which one you're looking for. It takes up less space. Folding makes sense, as annoying as it might be. It puts everything in its place in a nice, easy way. But let's face it, we don't wear folded clothes. We have to take them out, shake them out, and we have to put them on. The perfect lines and everything else that we might have, for those of you who still iron and starch, all disappear. Especially if you're in the upper Midwest in the last couple of days where, I mean, they, you know, they're thinking of building arcs. And I had friends call me and say, can you help? I said, I know a guy. That's four. Uh, <laughs> you know, that high humidity and everything else like that. But we still go through the process of folding to put it in its place. But its usefulness is not in how it's folded. How's your life of faith unfolding? And what caused it to unfold? There's so many things in life that we'd like to have in their nice little boxes, aren't there? You know, we have a place. We have bins. You have hangers. We have storage containers. We have garages. We go and buy extra storage for when we need more space. But we have spaces and we have organizations and we have files and we do all of these things to put everything in its proper place. And we often do the same thing with God, don't we? This is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is what you wear to church. I'm thankful that none of you have decided to wear your pajamas to church, those of you who are coming here. Those of you online, you could wear pajamas all you want. And I think that's part of the reason some of you are staying home. <laughs> we have our thoughts about God. What's right? What's wrong? We have rules about how things happen. Doctrine and theology. And we might all go, well, pastor, that's your purview. Doctrine and theology, that's you. <laughs> you do realize as you walk out in life wearing the clothes, the clothes of faith, you are proclaiming doctrine and theology by what you do, what you say, and how you are. There's a reason why the phrase is, you might be the only Bible some person ever reads. As a person of faith, you proclaim it by what you do, what you say. The call and the challenge is in baptism to let our light so shine before others that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. That's the challenge. That's the call. And that should be a reminder to us that it's always going. It doesn't stop. But is faith something that folds everything up and puts it in its nice little pace? Or is faith that which you can take out with you no matter where you are in whatever situation? You know, recently a theological doctrine was promulgated by the U.S. Conference of Bishops about, and the Catholic Conference of Bishops, about communion saying it's okay for certain politicians who advocate a particular position could be you know, refused communion. 
Why? Because they have failed to show proper penance in order to receive communion, all right? It's a question of worthiness and rightness and things like that. It comes out of a deep-seated ethical tradition of the Catholic Church. And so they make a decision. Here's this fold. But here's the question. How many of you are worthy to receive communion based on what you do and don't do? See, one of the hazards of keeping everything all folded up neat and clean is it looks good, but it's ultimately not very helpful or useful, is it? Because when you need that shirt, that's it. It's done. It's unfolded. But more importantly, it's now saying, oh, by the way, we are now taking this shirt and we've, folded, we've starched it, we've pressed it, we've shrink-wrapped it. It is now in this nice little plastic sack that's now off to the side. And it's now useless because here's what it's saying to you all. Don't touch. It's not for you anymore. Or worse yet, you now take that stance that says, well, I don't do that or that often. So therefore, it doesn't apply to me. I thank you, God, that I'm not like those poor miserable sinners. I think there's a story in the scriptures about that. Jesus has something to say about it. Because fundamentally, folks, this is not about our worthiness. This is about our need. Communion is not instituted because we were such wonderful people. Remember, who's there at the table? Judas, who right after dinner for dessert would go and sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. Peter, who would deny him not once, not twice, but three times, and 11, 10 other disciples who, upon being pressed about whose side are you on, bolted into the night. In the Gospel of Mark, there's a story about one of them that was in so much haste to get away that they grabbed him and ripped off his clothes and he ran away naked. So much for folded laundry, so much for any laundry. This is the table that Jesus said, here. Same table. Here. Now, dear pastor, what the heck does this have to do with these women in this healing story? Look at the story. Whose names do we know? Do we know the name of the woman who in faith walked up to Jesus in that crowd with that faith saying, all I need to do is touch the hem of his robe and I'll be healed? Do we know her name? How about the little girl that Jesus actually rose from the dead? We got to know her name, right? I mean, that's pretty serious. No. Whose name do we know? Her dad, the synagogue ruler, Jairus, who came and begged Jesus to come and heal his daughter. Why didn't he just take his daughter to Jesus? If she is so close to death, wouldn't it have been a lot simpler to just, <laughs> this is my little girl, help me? Here's the thing though. As a good synagogue leader, if he was touching someone who was sick, he became ritually unclean. Those are the folds of the rules. He couldn't Run in the synagogue. He couldn't do anything. He couldn't be religious because he is now unclean because he touched his sick daughter. How many of you have had a sick kid? How much did you, how often did you end up spending time touching them to bring them comfort and care? <gasps> but isn't there a rule? No, there isn't a rule about that. Then wash your hands. 
that's not a rule so much as a really good idea. And this woman, what's the big deal? Why does she have to sneak around? Heck, she probably wasn't even allowed in the town. If she's been bleeding, she's so ritually unclean that they probably kicked her out of town, had to go and sit in the red tent on the outskirts of town because she had blood. She had to sneak up. Women didn't associate with men in the public square, much less ones who were ritually unclean as badly as she was. No wonder she had to have faith. Her faith had come completely undone in everything she knew before. Her faith in her physicians, her faith in her community, her faith in everything else. But the only thing is she heard about Jesus and she had to get to him. But she knew that by the folds of the rules that she lived by, that her community lived by, that she actually could have been stoned for doing that. Does our life of faith unfold in a way that invites others in? That cares for others? That shows love and mercy? Or are we pretending to be 21st century Pharisees, thinking that the rules save. Stop and think of probably the greatest clothesline in all of history. Everything was aired out. And just for the record, despite all the artwork, he was naked up there. Because the humiliation was complete. And he did it. And oh, by the way, in the Old Testament, one of the longest standing curses is anyone who is hung on a tree is beyond salvation. So are we saved by our doing and not doing, by what we say and what we not say, or are we saved by him? Is great as our faithfulness or great as his faithfulness? Is it the faith, is it our faith in Christ or the faith of Christ that saves? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And we go, okay, yes, but believe in him, but those, you know, those who must believe in him shall not perish. What does the belief mean? Do you use that line to fold things up, put it away, separate out? In a sense, nullifying the gift of the love of God in Jesus Christ? We celebrate an open table, a beautiful savior. Why? He made it so. If I can stand behind it, you can come up to it. Anybody can come up to it. Because if we say that anyone is beyond the grace of God, how small have we made God? If we've made it about what you do or not do, then we have taken away what he's done. All of a sudden, love becomes conditional and grace becomes not that amazing. May we have the faith to unfold. May we allow that to unfold our lives, oftentimes unfold our clenched hands and our hardened hearts. May we allow Jesus to kind of shake the starch out of us and send us out. 
Send us out clothed in the cloth that makes a difference. And that's our baptismal robe that is given to us. And so I invite you to remind yourself of that gift and that promise of God that comes to us in baptism. If you repeat after me, please. I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. I've been marked with the cross of Christ forever. I am Christ's. That's the robe you wear. That's the clothes you, wear, clothes you wear. That's what we're called to be. That's the light that is given to us in that candle, that light that is to be shown before others through our good works so that God may be glorified. Brothers and sisters, and all who gather, we gather around the one who heals even hardened and broken hearts who loves even those who don't know what that word means and can bring back to life even that which we think is lost. May we not doubt but believe. And may we receive this love and share this world, love to the world. So remember that God loves you. And so do I. Amen.